In F1, sometimes the greatest enemy isn't the car beside you, it's the air. Every gust, every molecule, an invisible force. A battle no one sees but everyone feels. And while engineers spend sleepless nights simulating the impossible to dominate this art, I'm here to explain all of that. Ready? It's not a secret that aerodynamics in F1 isn't just about beauty. It's about tricking the wind into doing your homework for you. That's the truth. Every little bump and curve on those cars has a purpose. Nothing's there just because. Not the front wing, not the weird shark fin, not even that tiny antenna. Back in the old days, F1 cars were simple. Long, shiny tubes with four wheels, no wings, no fins, just a driver, some leather gloves, and blind faith, basically. In the 1950s, air was the enemy. It slowed you down. But then, in the mid-60s, some absolute madman asked, well, what if we use the air instead of fighting it? And that's how downforce was born. Downforce basically means air pressing the car down, helping it stick to the track through corners. Regular cars fight air like it's a wall. F1 cars flirt with it. The faster they go, the harder the air pushes them to the ground. It's like gravity, but custom built for speed. By the 1970s, teams got obsessed. Giant wings, ground effect tunnels, rubber skirts sealing the car to the track. It was all insane. The cars were fast, sure, but also sketchy. One bump and boom, the thing became a paper aeroplane. spun and crashed into the other cars. Jump to the 2000s, and engineers weren't just building cars anymore. They were crafting aerodynamic monsters. Every vent and flick looked like it came from a caffeine-fueled science project. Look at a 2008 Ferrari. Tell me that doesn't look like it's halfway through transforming into a drone. Now, here's the thing. People love to say all modern F1 cars look the same, but that's not laziness. That's physics basically saying, this is the way. The air doesn't care how much money you've got. That's why teams spend millions convincing it to behave. They literally fill wind tunnels with smoke just to watch how it slides over mirrors. It's kind of poetic if you think about it. So yeah, all those weird shapes, totally intentional. The long nose channels air under the chassis. The front wing splits and redirects it like a pro traffic cop. The barge boards keep dirty air off the tires. And that big rear wing everyone makes fun of? That's the hero keeping the car from spinning like a Beyblade every time it hits 180 miles per hour. Think of air like water. An F1 car doesn't cut through it, it glides over it. That's why it looks alien. It's not built for us, it's built for air itself. While regular cars chase style, F1 cars chase performance. Perfection that somehow looks ridiculous and beautiful at the same time. It's painful for engineers, heaven for designers, and pure serotonin for fans watching those wings flex mid-corner. So yeah, next time someone says modern F1 cars are ugly, remind them, beauty doesn't win championships, downforce does. And you know what? What else wins championships? That's right, subscribing to the channel, because ignoring the subscribe button is like ignoring aerodynamics. Let's be honest, air isn't just a passenger in F1, it's the real final boss. And like Thanos said, I am inevitable. Yeah, that's air in F1. Maybe it doesn't snap fingers, just lap times. If the enemy is invisible, how do you fight it at 200 miles per hour? That's basically every F1 engineer's daily nightmare because it isn't just wind, it's resistance, chaos and pain all wrapped into one invisible bully. When an F1 car blasts down the straight, two things happen. First, air pushes back. That's drag. The thing slowing the car down like a giant, invisible wall. Then air also pushes down. That's downforce. The magic that keeps the car glued to the track instead of going full SpaceX launch mode. The trick is balancing both. You want maximum grip, but minimal resistance. In other words, bully the air just enough before it decides to bully you back. So to fight back against this invisible rival, engineers did something wild. They stopped looking above the car and started looking underneath it. Welcome to ground effect, or as I like to call it, the upside down aeroplane trick. Instead of wings pushing the car down, the air under the floor gets sucked out, which literally pulls the car into the asphalt. The faster it goes, the stronger the grip. Basically, the floor becomes a high-speed vacuum cleaner. Just one that occasionally costs $10 million to fix. And in 2022, Formula One brought ground effect to another level. The whole point was to make racing closer and reduce something called dirty air, that turbulent mess behind the cars that used to make following someone feel like swimming through soup. So engineers got sneaky. They designed Venturi tunnels under the floor. These channels speed up airflow underneath, creating low pressure and pulling the car closer to the ground. And it actually worked. Maybe a little too well. Suddenly, cars had insane grip, but at 
high speeds, that suction got unstable. The car would bounce up and down violently, like a kid on a sugar rush. That's porpoising, when the air vacuum starts overreacting and your $10 million machine turns into a pogo stick on wheels. Hamilton's back looked like he'd just gone 12 rounds with a chiropractor. Teams were at a loss, trying everything, raising ride heights, softening floors, doing whatever they could to stop the bounce. It took months to calm it down, and even then, the air still found new ways to mess with them. But that's F1 for you. The air never really loses. It just changes tactics. One year it ruins your lap time, the next it ruins your spine. And at the end of the day, air is both the enemy and the weapon. It slows you down, but also keeps you alive through corners. But let's go deeper, because there's more than just the engineers playing with the air. We need to talk about the stupid amount of things they created to improve the cars. Let's see if you can survive 10 more minutes of aerodynamic brain damage. All right, starting with the front wing, the car's nose, and the first thing punching through the air at ridiculous speed. But here's the secret. It's not there to look cool or make the car mean. Every bit of air that hits it gets split, redirected, and told exactly where to go, over, under, or around the car. And if it messes that up, congrats, you just turned your multi-million dollar rocket into a Jeep Wrangler. Every millimeter matters. One angle, a scratch, or even a little tape missing, and boom, the whole car loses its balance. Now let's move to the rear wing. Think of it as a giant parachute. When it's working right, it pushes the car into the track so hard, it feels glued down. The grip is unreal. You can take sketchy corners at high speed, send it full throttle, and the car stays planted. But when the wing's not happy, the car starts fishtailing, going into full-on drift masters mode. Too much downforce, you're slow on straights. Too little, you're flying without wings. Literally. That's where DRS comes in. The magic flap. The little button drivers press to turn their car from a brick into a missile for a few seconds. When it opens, the air flows through instead of hitting the wing. That means less drag and more speed. That's right, the only legal cheat code in F1. You can only use it if you're within one second of the car ahead. Basically, it's F1's way of saying, here, have a free overtake attempt. Good luck. John Leclerc can't cover him off. Verstappen takes the lead at the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix. And there are many in the grandstands who like that as Leclerc goes too deep into turn two. But don't let that flap fool you. It's insanely complex. Teams spend hours adjusting how fast it opens, how much it opens, and how quickly it shuts, because if it sticks open, congrats, you're now piloting a kite at 180 miles per hour. Uh, no, oh, I don't think you did. DRS open or not, Crofty there, did you? DRS is like a trust fall with your car, and you better hope your car catches you. We saw this recently with Bortoleto's crash at the Brazilian GP. At the time of losing control of the car, his DRS was open, leading to a massive impact of what I heard to be 57 Gs. Over the years, these wings have gone from sketchy aeroplane knockoffs to literal masterpieces of engineering. The front has up to five little layers, all shaping air within surgeon level precision. The rear ones even bend slightly at high speeds, not because they're weak, but because teams purposely make them flex to cheat drag. Mercedes, Red Bull, Ferrari, they all play different games with the air. Mercedes tries to outsmart it, Red Bull straight up dominates it. It's like watching scientists argue with the wind. Still, every driver knows one painful truth. Wings are sensitive. One weekend, they're untouchable. The next, they're dog water. And if you touch them a bit stronger than they want, gone. When the airflow hugs the car just right and everything clicks, that's when F1 looks like art. So next time you see a car blasting down a straight, remember, those wings are the only reason it hasn't taken off yet. And while those get all the glory, there's even more magic that happens in the middle. The lungs of the car, where every breath of air decides who flies and who fries. It's not just some random bodywork with stickers. It's the system that filters and sculpts the air before it reaches the back. Think of it as the car's respiratory system, except instead of oxygen, it inhales air and exhales purple sectors. Let's start with the side pods, those curvy things hugging each side of the cockpit. Their job is simple, feed air into the radiators and keep the engine from becoming a $10 million barbecue. Now, when new regs kicked in, every team had their own take on this. Ferrari went with a wide and curvy design. Very Italian, very aesthetic. Red Bull, though, they went the complete opposite. Their side pods were so tiny, they looked like an empty Dorito bag. But somehow, it worked like magic. And then there's Mercedes, who looked at both and said, what if we just don't? They practically deleted their side pods. It looked futuristic, sure, but the car overheated like a PS4 and bounced down the straights like it was doing CrossFit. They eventually added proper pods back in 2023. But by then, Red Bull had already run off with everyone's homework. So 
What's the deal with all these shapes? It's about air management. You want the airflow to stay clean and organized before it hits the back of the car. That's where stuff like deflectors and turning vanes come in. They're basically traffic cops for air. They redirect the mess so the car doesn't lose stability. Before these though, teams had barge boards. Remember those spiky panels on the sides of old F1 cars? They look like someone glued origami to the chassis. They were the MVPs of early airflow control, slicing through dirty air and protecting rear downforce. Then the FIA said, too crazy, and banned them for good. The new deflectors are cleaner, smoother, and a lot more efficient. They guide the air straight into the floor tunnels, kind of like bouncers at a club. Only the clean air gets in. Each team plays their own version of aero chess. And here's the kicker. When airflow in the middle gets messy, everything else collapses. The car becomes unpredictable and just plain toxic to drive. So yeah, the middle of the car might not look flashy, but it's the unsung hero of every race. It's where performance is born, heat is tamed, and championships quietly take shape. Kinda poetic, right? For something that mostly just pushes air around. Now it's time to see how it sticks, because down below, there's a whole aerodynamic black hole sucking these cars into the track like it owes them money. The real cheat code in F1 is the part nobody sees. The true MVP of modern racing, the floor. Now I know it doesn't look exciting. It's flat, dark, and just kind of there. But that thing is black magic with a physics degree. When air moves under the car, it travels faster than the air above it. And when air speeds up, pressure drops. That low pressure literally sucks the car to the track. So while wings get all the attention, the floor is doing most of the heavy lifting. At the back, you've got the diffuser. It's like the cooldown zone for all that air. It takes the fast moving flow under the car and lets it expand smoothly, which keeps the low pressure stable. Think of it like this. The floor sucks, the diffuser expulses, and the rear wing just chills at the back, pretending it did all the work. Together, they create what engineers call ground effect. Once a team figures out that perfect airflow, they chase it to perfection. For example, that amazing case in 2009. Braun GP, a team nobody expected to win anything, found a loophole so clever the entire grid lost their damn minds. It was called the double diffuser. Basically, they split the airflow into two levels, doubling the suction, doubling the downforce, and doubling everyone else's suffering. Within a few races, they were untouchable. Jensen Button was out there driving as if gravity was optional. Other teams tried to copy it, but by the time they caught up, Braun had already dipped with the championship. Jensen Button, the 2009 world champion. Look at the relief, look at the joy. When you build something so powerful they make it illegal, you know you've done something right. And that's exactly what the FIA did. They banned it. Nowadays, teams like Red Bull have mastered that same concept. Their floor looks clean from the outside, but underneath is a maze of tiny tunnels and edges that guide the air where it has to go. One wrong detail, and suddenly your car goes from elite to shit. That's why mechanics cover those parts like they're hiding national secrets. Because they literally are. And yeah, we all remember that crane in Monaco accidentally showing Red Bull's entire floor. Skill issue. When it works perfectly, it's not just speed. It's poetry. But now you can go ahead and forget everything you just learned, or at least part of it, because for 2026 we have the same spell book, just written by someone who's watched too much Black Mirror. F1 always says they'll achieve closer racing, but what if, this time, they actually mean it? Because 2026 isn't just another rule change, it's a total makeover. The cars are about to shrink, lose weight, and finally stop bullying the air around them. Yeah, the wind's been waiting for revenge since 1950. First off, the cars are literally going on a diet. Shorter, narrower, lighter. With less weight comes less drag, which means less downforce. In simple terms, they'll grip less, slide more, and make overtakes a little sketchier. But that's part of the fun, right? Smaller cars also mean tighter battles and fewer moments where two drivers think they can fit side by side through a corner that's basically the width of a bathroom door. And the biggest twist, DRS is gone. That magic button that turned overtaken into an easy mode cheat code is being replaced by something much cooler, active aero. Picture this, the car literally changing shape mid-race. The wings flatten on the straights for speed and tilt back in corners for grip. The FIA says it will make overtaking more natural and less robotic. Fans? Half of them are hyped. Half think someone's gonna press the wrong button and accidentally open a parachute. Now let's talk about everyone's favorite trauma, porpoising. Remember the bouncing spectacle that we talked about before? Yep, the car's hopping down straights like pogo sticks. The FIA is reducing ground effect suction, so no more accidental aquatic performances. Wings are also being simplified, which means less dirty air and more wheel-to-wheel -wheel action. 
Drivers might actually see who they're racing instead of disappearing into a fog of turbulence. I'm cautiously optimistic, because every time they promise closer racing, it either delivers magic or boredom. And since the new hybrid engines are smaller and greener, teams have to redesign the car's entire shape for cooling, side pods, intakes, everything. The result? Cars that will look like aerodynamic puzzles built by someone who's never seen a triangle before. But that's the price of progress, I guess. Visually, these cars are going to be weird. Like, are we sure this is F1 weird? Some fans will hate it, others will call it innovation. But give it time. We all mocked the Halo once, and now it's part of F1's dress code. In the end, 2026 feels like a clean slate. A mix of science, hope, and probably a bit of chaos. Smaller cars, smarter wings, less turbulence. Whether it works or not, it's another attempt to fix the very thing that makes F1 so unpredictable. The air itself. At the end of the day, no matter how much F1 tries to outsmart the wind, the truth is simple. The future of speed will always belong to whoever learns to dance with the air, not fight it. If you enjoyed watching the science behind the F1 circus, make sure to watch this video I know you'll love. And as always, thank you for watching.